only would that hymn be a lie, but the truth that it proclaims could never come to pass. How could those that have been redeemed be saved to sin no more if there are people for whom Christ died there right now? The hymn writers knew their theology quite well, didn't they? To all the ransom church. This is our text for today, isn't it? This is I'm going to put my thing on. Find it. It's our text for today. This is Acts chapter 20. Oh, by the way, if there's if you if you if you want to know a little bit of theology about the person of Christ today, read carefully Calvin's uh, exposition. He's, he's, I took out the section where he talks about the blood of God, okay? That God bought the church with his blood, okay? Now, this, this was a major part of my research when I did my dissertation. And uh, this was part of the solution that I that I utilized in understanding the person of Christ and uh, the use of the what is called the communicatio idiomatum, uh, fancy Latin term for the exchange of properties or the communication of properties that uh, the Calvinists differed with the Lutherans on and basically said that the, the attributes of either nature can be attributed to the person. So, for example, in this text, the humanity of Christ, okay, the blood, which is true of his humanity, not of his divine nature, right, is attributed to him as God. So God buys the church with his blood. Obviously, God doesn't have blood because God doesn't have a body, right? What does the children's catechism say? God is a spirit, right? And hath not a body like man. Do you see? God is a spirit. This is the basic teaching of John chapter 4, right? Where Christ met the Samaritan. So if God doesn't have a body, then how can he have blood? Do you see? It's through the incarnation. Through the one person in two natures, where the one truth from the one nature is applied to the person who is God incarnate. So God is said to have blood. And the Son of Man, which is on earth, is said to be in heaven. These, these are important teachings. He, he says more about it in the Institutes, but this section from Acts I thought was really good, so I wanted to include that in there for you. Alright, well, Today we are in Acts chapter 20 and uh, continuing our theme about the church. Uh, this, is, this is one of these passages where, uh, you know, you, you love it and you hate it at the same time because you can see the great wonder of grace that God has poured out in His Son, the Lord Jesus, but at the same time, in God's wisdom and providence, you see that Paul was fully aware of the ravenous wolves that would enter into the institutional church. And I don't mean that we hate the Word of God, obviously. I mean that we hate the fact that these things happen, but we accept them as part of God's providence. But we must remember what Paul said here. I'm going to read this text again. I want to look from verse 13 and following. And we went before to ship and sailed unto Assos. They are intending to take Paul. For so had he appointed, making himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried about, tarried at Tregillion. 
and the next day we came to Miletus. But Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible, for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I had been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing but was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that you would be magnified here in our midst, that you would speak to your people, your word, that you would edify us, that you would exalt the Lord Jesus, that you would appoint us to the ministry you would have us do. Christ's sake alone we pray. And amen. So this text is a very, very interesting one concerning the church. I like that uh, we, we get Luke's first person plural perspective here because he, as the writer of the book of Acts, you, utilizes this expression beginning with the we, the we sections in book of Acts indicate that he was a traveler along with Paul. So when we see verse 6 of we sail, you notice that. And uh, in verse 13 again he says, and we went before to ship. Um, this very famously is referred to as uh, the first person you know, perspective of Paul and Luke. So he is credited as being the writer and being a witness to the life of Paul. And therefore, this has great testimony to the truth of his account. Um, 
very interesting in and of itself. Paul tells us a little bit about his ministry, and especially among the time he was with these saints in Ephesus, whom he loved dearly and uh, called for these elders, even as he would see them for the last time with his physical eyes on this earth, and uh, was very moved. Um, I was tempted to spend some time on this incident that we read earlier today when we read the entire chapter about the young man, Eutychus, who fell out the window. That's, that's such a, uh, a picturesque uh, depiction and uh, I, I would like to preach on it because it's so apropos to being proclaimed about how we can sit on a window and uh, look both ways, so to speak be infatuated with the world and then want to be in the church and eventually what happens to us is we sleep and of course that leads to falling out of the window and there's a, there's a whole message in that I'll leave that for another time um, by the way the, the name Eutychus Eftichos uh, which is interesting because in Greek it means good fortune um, I don't know whether the good fortune has to do with him falling or with the, the idea of good fortune, the fact that he did die. But Eutychus is, uh, is one of those terms where the name is appropriate because Paul was there and uh, Paul reminded everyone that the life was still in the young man. I doubt whether Eutychus ever slept in a window after that. Sometimes it takes for a severe fall before we will listen. And one more aspect before I move on. You're probably glad that I will not be preaching till midnight. All right. So here, Paul speaks of the church. He speaks of the church being bought by the blood of God. As we said earlier, this, this notion that the redeemed church will come to its own in the eschaton, of course, when the very last of God's elect will be saved and saved to sin no more, as the hymn says. Uh, this is according to God's timetable, of course, we don't know when. But this is a teaching that we must not set aside. You remember last week we spoke about that hymn, the uh, church is one foundation, with the line about him coming, seeking that church to redeem. He came to seek, save. God has a mission to save a people that people are made up of individuals and they're given to Christ from the Father and from heaven he came to save them. From heaven he came to seek them and redeem them. And so here Paul testifies that Christ gave his blood, shed his life so that he would buy, redeem the church of God. But even though the blood redeems the church of God, the institutional church has many dangers to face. And this is where Paul brings very, very critical warning to the church. He brings it to these leaders and he tells them several things that are, are of vital significance. Number one, he tells them that they are shepherds by the leading of the Holy Ghost. They have not been appointed shepherds by men, but they are gifted by God. Shepherds, overseers, bishops, pastors, all of these terms basically refer to the one thing, the elder or elders, plural, as we have it here, that are the leadership, the spiritual leadership of the church. These are those who are set apart by the Holy Spirit 
You recall even Paul, when he was going on his missionary journey, the Holy Spirit said, set aside Barnabas and Paul for the ministry which I have for them. Men often put their hands on other men and ordain them. And that's fine. But just because a man puts his hands on you, doesn't mean that you are set apart by the Holy Spirit. We would hope that each one that has been ordained by a man's hand put upon them has been set apart by the Holy Spirit. We would. It's so God's glory that everyone that has been ordained is indeed set apart by the Holy Spirit. Paul, knowing these particular uh, men who, who were leaders in the church in Ephesus, uh, he tells them that that's who they are. So, in a sense, he is telling the authentic elders and leaders of the church that they have been set apart by God. Set apart by God. The other thing, obviously, here is that he gives them an example of his own ministry. So he gives them the source of their ministry, and then he gives them an example of ministry. In looking at the three years he spent with them, he says, with many tears, and in the midst of temptations, from his own fellow countrymen, who he designates as the Jews. He sees them as a set-apart group of people that are antagonistic towards Paul and his ministry. Even though he was a national Jew himself, of course a Roman citizen, trained in Greek and what have you, but yet a Jew, but sets those people aside and says, the Jews, temptations that he faced, trials that he faced from his fellow countrymen. You could read about these things in the second book of Corinthians where he makes specific mention again of that. He speaks of the desire to lead men to the knowledge of the truth. He says that he has publicly proclaimed and from home to home, from house to house, has proclaimed, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a sort of summary, if you will, of his gospel proclamation. This is the example of his own ministry and he's reminding these elders that have been given the oversight and the leadership role to shepherd these men and women who are the church of the living God. Here's what I did, here's what you need to do as well. There's the source of the ministry, here's the example of the ministry. And then he goes on and he says that not only did I do that, but I testified to the gospel of the grace of God and I intend to end my life testifying to the grace of God. When the temptation was to compromise, when Peter got caught up in it, and Barnabas even, you know, with the simulation um, and the, the, you know, the, the, the idea that the Jews were coming and in Galatia they, they faltered, Paul is the only one who stood firm. And he said, not even for an hour, he said, that the truth of the grace of God may remain with you, that the true gospel would remain with you, he even confronted another apostle. Here's, here's such an example here that he says, look, I want to finish my course with joy. If you want an example of ministry, here it is. One that you can look back on the past and say, look, here he's been faithful preaching this all the way through, and he looks forward to the few years that remain. That's what I want to do. 
I want to proclaim and testify to this gospel of the grace of God. And he also further identifies it as preaching the kingdom of God. Preaching the kingdom of God. This is all encompassing his ministry. He says, I am not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now, of course, this, this means that Paul was a preacher of the word as he had it, which was, in his day, twofold. It was the written Old Testament, and then some of the oral tradition that was handed down, truth about Christ, things that he learned from other apostles, and then by immediate revelation to him of the truth of Christianity. So ultimately, we have in its completeness the Old Testament scriptures, and then in, in its embryonic form and its early development, the New Testament. Now, we have it all encapsulated in the Holy Bible, the 66 books of the Protestant canon. No Deuterocanonical books, no apocryphal books, but only those that have been recognized, recognized as the inspired, inerrant, Fallible word of God. Now let me just pause here for a moment because today you will hear from many quarters that the church gave us the word of God. That is not true. The church people, men and women, make up the body of Christ are created by the Word of God. We are born again by the Word. The Word is instrumental in our salvation. And when the church, as a group of people, testified and said, these are the books that are canonical, it wasn't by fiat, it wasn't by declaration, it wasn't that they were authority over the word, but they were subject to the truth of canonicity that the word in itself had already. They recognized something about the truth of the writings that is inherent in the writings. Recognition is not the same as authorization. The church didn't authorize which books as if the church sits as an authority over the Bible, but the church recognized that which God had already instilled in these writings and in none other. It's a matter of recognition, not of authorization. The church recognized because it was led by the Spirit to see the authenticity of the Word as it is in itself. Paul, when he writes to the Thessalonians, says, when you received the Word, you received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in itself, the Word of God. As it is in itself. The church doesn't give credence to the writings and makes them the Word of God, but sits under their authority, recognizing that these are indeed the very words of God, preserved in written form for the church. So, Paul speaks of this, that he dared not shun the whole counsel of God, and that recognizes now the warnings for ministry.
these warnings center among two different groups. He says, number one, after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in among you. So you've got outsiders coming in. Outsiders being these grievous wolves that will enter in and they will not spare the flock. They will not spare the sheep. Of course, this can have various application. More troubling, I guess, is what he says next, that also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Here are the warnings of the ministry that number one, there will be people from the world that will enter into the church and they will not be the pastors that God wants for the congregations, but they will be ravenous wolves. This echoes the teachings of Christ himself. Did he not speak to us of wolves in sheep's clothing? False prophets who teach the commandments of men as if they are the oracles of God. Teaching traditions as if they are the binding word of God. Today you will fill your ears with this nonsense if you watch on TV. Many so-called preachers today, you can enter the houses of worship and hear these things over and over and over again. Humanism has infiltrated the church in our day, and of course Paul said it would happen back in the first century. Two types, those coming in and those arising from these are more deadly because they are not so easy to discern. Because they are people of the church. Not people from outside, but people of the church. They rise from within the ranks of the congregations. They are the ones that have been trained since they uh, have been young. They have grown up in the church. They are among the people of God. And yet... Paul says, this is how you define them, that they will take disciples unto themselves. That they will draw out these people so that they would be disciples after them. As opposed, of course, to being disciples after God. After Christ. Both of these groups are described as not sparing the flock. The sheep, because they are sheep, need to be fed. The sheep need to be guided. The sheep need to be protected. The sheep need good shepherds. That's what Paul is praying for these men, these elders, these ones who have been set aside by the Holy Spirit, these ones who have in Paul a great example, they need to take heed to these warnings and implement the safeguards of ministry by proclaiming the word of God and thereby feeding the flock. The primary, the most important, the most significant the one that is on the top of the list of necessities for an elder, for a preacher, for a pastor, for an overseer, for a bishop, whichever term you use, is to preach the word of God. Paul's counsel to Timothy and Titus abounds with the idea of doctrine and teaching and proclaiming and preaching. These are the terms that he uses. Here he uses the metaphor of feeding the sheep. 
feed the flock, feed the sheep. Not with morsels from the world, but with the very word of God. You remember Jesus said that man lives not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is what we must be preaching, the word of God. Preaching the word of God. Preaching the Bible. Not all preaching that is out of the Bible is preaching the Bible. There is much preaching that goes on that takes texts from the Bible and sounds like biblical preaching. But it is not biblical preaching. It is men preaching what they want, not what they have heard from God in Scripture. Notice again that Paul talks of this ministry that needs to preserve because these false teachers will perverse the right way. Watch and remember. So here is the way now they need to follow the example and follow these injunctions. Watch be alert, because now you need to be on the ramparts. You need to keep watch. You need to be a sentry. You need to be a man who stands in the gap. You need to watch and look for those that are coming in. Look for those that arise from within. You need to be able to discern them. And remember, remember how I dealt with them, now you deal with them the same way. I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. His gracious word. Remember when Luke tells us in, in, in chapter 4 when God spoke and He did these great things and, and they were amazed at His gracious words. Words. Words, words are words, right? What, what, what is that expression we have in English? Talk is cheap. Words are words. Words don't mean anything. When there are words of men, they're, they're nothing. But when there are words of God, when there are words of God, God's words accomplish things. God's words act upon us. God's words change us. God's words are what we need to be. This is the only hope for the church today. If the church wants to be the group of sanctified people that Paul speaks of, if we want to become like the inheritors of this kingdom, if we want to be those who share in this inheritance, then we must hear and heed the pure words of God. We must return to Scripture like it is our only hope. And you know what? It is. We have no other link to Christ. You cannot find Christ out there in the world. You can't find Christ in any other literature. You're not going to find Him anywhere else. Even where they're writing about Him, you're not going to find Him. He's mentioned in the Quran. Jesus. But the Jesus of the Quran is not the Jesus of the New Testament. Is not the Jesus of the Bible. You want to look at literature? Say, from my tradition, the Greek tradition, one of the most famous, Nicholas Kanzazakis, he wrote the book, The Last Temptation of Christ. He speaks about Christ. But his Christ is not the Christ of the Gospels. His Christ, his Jesus, is a figment of his imagination. You don't want to read about Jesus? You can read about Jesus in the world's literature. We'll tell you about Jesus. Everybody's got an opinion. But at the end of the day, 
we are going to be among those who are sanctified, those who have the inheritance. We need to be built up by this word of grace, this pure teaching of God, this gospel, this counsel of God, this true grace of God, this word that alone has been preserved through the years by God himself. The God who inspired the scriptures preserved it and we are now the trustees. That is why the church is the pillar and ground of truth. Because we have been entrusted with the very oracles of God. The source of ministry is the movement of the Spirit in our midst to raise up men, to make them overseas, to give them. The example of ministry can be no better than the one we see here in Paul. Shedding tears and pleading, not having the blood of any man on his conscience. The dangers of ministry and the warnings that come along with it. Men who would assert the authority of this kind of leadership. Men that are hungry for self-proclamation and desire for men to follow them. And then the solutions to these problems. You return to the pristine gospel of God's grace. And God's grace presumes, presumes that we are needy, that we are sinners, that we are wretched and poor and blind and miserable and naked. God's grace presumes these things. And that's why they're the only hope for humanity. The grace preaching of the gospel is the only thing that can save us. Because it's the only preaching that brings forth Christ in his pristine splendor as Savior and Lord to whom we owe all allegiance. And by His grace, He leads us into the living waters of redemption. Christ lived and died so that we could have this eternal life. I give my life, He says. He says, you will live because I live. His resurrection after the death that He encountered so cruelly in place of sinners. He is the living Lord. When we proclaim Christ today, we do not proclaim a dead Christ. We proclaim the living Lord. So this word, this gospel, this preaching of the kingdom, however you want to define it or identify it based on these words from Paul, is our only hope. For the church to be the church. For the church to be the church. It must root out all false teachings and all false teachers. And it must grow in the true word of God. Peter said, desire the pure milk whereby you may grow. This is the gospel which has been preached to you, he says. Desire this true word of God in which you may grow. Out with the junk, in with the pure milk of God's word. Paul understood that. He lived it, he proclaimed it, he was ready to die for it. And in this last meeting with these beloved men that he co-labored with and loved, leads with them. This is his last word to them. Be careful. Preach the word. Preach the word. Protect the flock with the word. Feed the church 
word is our lifeline. Let's pray together. God, we know that Paul kept nothing back, Lord, and we have so often in the church held back so much. Forgive us. Let us be recommitted to the entirety of your truth as the entirety of your word is true. Let us be committed once more to the full counsel of God. Let us be committed to this gospel proclamation and this preaching of the kingdom of God. Let us remember to call men to repentance and to faith. Let us not be ashamed of this gospel. But let us, Lord, forth the claims of Christ upon us for